1954, the scene of tragic and dramatic events. More than 200,000 refugees left their homelands in the border areas to escape hostilities. They went to the neighboring regions of Tunisia and Morocco, taking with them only what they could carry on their backs. From then on, they depended for survival on the charity and generosity of their fellow human beings. the faithful throughout the Islam world. There is a saying of the Prophet which is quoted among the Muslim people to express their feeling of solidarity with one another. Man is to man what stone is to stone in giving and receiving strength in a structure. When from Algeria the refugees arrived, they did not have to ask. They were welcome. The local population offered to share their food with them. They were neighbors among neighbors. But the land could not feed all the people. The resources of the Tunisian and Moroccan governments were soon exhausted. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees was asked to help. At his request, the International Committee of the Red Cross gave initial relief. Then, the League of Red Cross Societies and the High Commissioner organized an operation on a wider scale. This became, from 1959 onwards, the main international assistance program for the refugees in Tunisia and Morocco. Since then, over 275,000 rations have been distributed every month in 27 centers in Morocco and 33 centers in Tunisia. In Figuig, a small Moroccan town in the Sahara, distribution is every 12th of the month at 8 in the morning. The team arrives the evening before after hours of strenuous driving through rough desert tracks. The leader of the league team, a Swiss, checks the situation with a super Kaid. Of the 4,000 refugees who draw their rations in Figig, many live in the desert, some as far as 70 miles away. As soon as the sun rises over the horizon, the refugees begin to arrive. They want to be present from the earliest hour. It is as if they were afraid to miss their rations if they were not to arrive long before the distribution time. In some of the largest centers, where distribution takes several days, people stay in the queue for two or three days, eating and sleeping in the open. When the team begins to fence in the distribution area with a wall of empty oil drums, there is already a considerable crowd. The preparations are watched intently. Is there a difference in the rations? Will anything be missing? But there is a general atmosphere of good humor, even if occasionally a man or a woman has to be told to get back in line. The older men sit in a circle in the middle. In all Muslim communities, the elderly heads of families are highly respected and have therefore been given priority in the distribution. But it wouldn't be human if some of the elders weren't to try to get in front of the others. Like this old man he has a way with him of getting right up in front. Oh, 
For every member of the family, there is 120 grams of soap, about four ounces. 400 grams of sugar, approximately 14 ounces. 400 grams, nearly a pint, of edible oil, practically the only fat used in Arab cooking. The ration cards are carefully checked each time. After the old men, it is the turn of the others. At one time, the women were served first, but the shrewd heads of families in Figig all send their wives. As a result, the men from the outlying districts had to wait until the very end. Now, it is 10 men after every 10 women. The women are often the most difficult customers. Hesitation on the part of a Red Crescent worker is enough to set their tongues loose. In this former garrison church, which the Catholic Archbishop of Casablanca has placed at the disposal of the relief organization, the wheat and rice are distributed. For every refugee, there is 10 kilos, about 22 pounds of wheat, and 2 kilos, or 4 pounds, of rice. Wheat is the main basic ration. In North Africa, every family bakes its own bread. It makes its semolina, or the traditional couscous, a dish of steamed semolina, boiled vegetables, and meat or chicken, if there is any. Some of the refugees have not touched meat for more than a year. Outside the church, the children of the local poor come to glean the fallen grains. Charity is not the privilege of the rich alone. The refugees, too, share part of what they have received with others. <laughs> In barely two hours, the distribution is completed. Some refugee families share motorized transport. But most return individually, the donkey loaded down with the family rations for one month. An Arab family is not just father, mother and children, but it includes the grandparents, the brothers and their wives and their children, possibly also cousins. Sometimes, a family is a group of over 20 people. The caravans leave in a long procession through the Figig main street. Once a month, the Bedouin caravan leaders have again goods to carry, the rations for their community in exile. discovered in the ancient Roman ruins in North Africa are still being used. The life-saving wheat. The life-saving wheat brought across from oceans to North African ports, stored, distributed, milled, baked, eaten. The life-saving wheat and the other rations have been forming a cycle uniting people of many races. Man is to man what stone 
promise to stone, in giving and receiving strength in a structure. breakdown in organization would have entailed starvation and famine. There were moments of anxiety. The yearly cost of the operation, eight million dollars, may not be beyond the limits of human generosity, but they have to be brought together in goods and in money. They were provided on the basis of a ration of 1,540 calories a day. demands the utmost economy in preparing the food so that by the end of each month the family won't have to face hunger. It just allows for survival. In the mountains the refugee build themselves gurbis, a roof of foliage spread over a frame of branches, the whole resting on a circle of mud or stone walls with a hole serving as entrance. On the plains and in the desert, the refugees live in tents, usually made by themselves in the traditional style. A number of nomads arrived with the remnants of their flock. This family once owned 300 animals, but most were killed or died during the exodus. This is what is left. A dozen or so sheep and goats, the source of some milk and wool, but a symbol of the hope of a new flock in the homeland. During the rainy season, the refugees on the plain cut alpha grass, which they exchange for additional food. Alpha mats are also made on looms provided by the relief operation. The mats are used for repairing tents or are sold in the local market. In the hills and mountains, the refugees have the right to cut dead brushwood. This refugee in Tunisia was lucky in discovering a dead cork tree. There is enough to sell some of it in the market in the nearest town. There is always need for wood among the townspeople. The offer is accepted, the deal is concluded. 250 millims about a half a dollar for a donkey load of wood, just over four shillings. The only money this man has held in his hands for two years. But now he can bring home a few spices and some tea. Most of the time, no money, never any work, no land. And the burden of an uncertain future that is what makes exile heavy for all refugees, whether they are in Europe, in Asia, or in Africa. 
In these conditions, the refugees can only hope to find shelter, but not a new active existence. They depend entirely on international assistance. The diet of 1,540 calories a day is often all they have. But this is not enough for growing children. And more than 50% of all refugees are children. Therefore, a special effort had to be made. A lifeline of 160 milk stations was created. Every morning as they go to school, 90,000 refugee children receive a cup of vitamin-enriched milk and a piece of bread. <laughs> Today, the refugee children are healthy and vigorous as they walk from home to milk station and from milk station to school. The Tunisian and Moroccan authorities opened their schools to all the refugee children. But in some cases, international help was needed to provide additional school facilities. There are so many children that lessons are given in two shifts. But the thirst for knowledge is so great that the afternoon group usually listens to the morning lessons from the outside. And the morning group does the same in the afternoon. When classes are over, whenever the children are free, they occupy themselves with the smaller tasks of the household such as getting water from the well. But like all children, they like to play, even toys are rare. There is a game children know all over the world. All that is needed are a few pebbles to throw in the air and catch them deftly on the back of the hand. mountain areas, on the high plains where the climate can be very rigorous in winter, an additional operation was started in 1960. At lunchtime, the children assemble in front of the Red Crescent tent of their area to receive a cup of steaming hot soup and a piece of bread. a week, meat is added to the diet. So that mothers will know their children ate their soup, 
A little mark is made on the ham. dispersed over hundreds of miles, a special health service had to be started. Doctors tour the areas at regular intervals. Most frequent diseases are trachoma, malaria, and tuberculosis. Their incidence has now been reduced to normal proportions for the area. But here is a battle that will have to continue for many years as part of the effort to raise the living standards of the people. In addition to the doctor's service, a close network of dispensaries has been created where locally trained health workers can deal with the simple cases, referring the others to the doctor. Here, patients receive medication and treatment. This health service is extremely popular among the refugees. In some centers, between three and 400 patients are helped every day. During the winter, the climate can be freezing cold in North Africa. In the winter of 61, there were six feet of snow in this area. The refugees usually stay indoors around their fires. To help them, tens of thousands of blankets were distributed and hundreds of tons of secondhand clothing. And yet... <laughs> Of the children, kashabias are distributed once a year. These are outer garments with a hood to keep the children warm. With the best will in the world, it is impossible to make these youngsters understand that there is no need to push one another, that if they were to stand quietly in a line, as they do when queuing up for milk and soup, they would all receive one. But the children are too excited, too afraid also that there might not be enough kashabias to go around. If anything describes the extreme poverty of these children, their extreme dependence on outside help, it is this groping fear that lives inside their hearts. The generosity will stop short of them. Miriam and her little brother cried bitter tears while the others walked away with their beautiful kashabias. They were the last ones, but there was still one for each. And now, there is almost a smile. This is what has been done with eight million dollars a year. Every month, a regular distribution of over a quarter of a million rations. And every day, bread and milk for 90,000 children. Soup stations in certain areas, new clothing, blankets, tents, schools, 
a completely new health service. The operation has received the support of 65 nations through National Red Cross, Red Crescent, Red Lion and Sun Societies, through various voluntary agencies, private groups, contributions from governments, and individuals. All the year round, the gifts from abroad are sorted out, and in the case of second-hand clothing, assembled according to size and age group. Even the used flower sacks are turned into shirts and dresses. This is done by young refugee girls in the Red Crescent Training School in Urda in Morocco. Young married women, too, are among the pupils. Vidi? The course is followed with earnest attention by these teenage girls. Vidi Hekdik? Nagdiri Khmsa? Diri Rba? Burros? The return to the homeland is the only future for these youngsters and their parents. The refugees were received as neighbors among neighbors by the Tunisian and Moroccan people. They were helped by the international community. But their real life cannot lie here, for there is no work, no opportunity to settle. And they all want to return home, and the return becomes possible. Behind them lies a long, depressing period of uncertainty and waiting when they were just managing to survive thanks to the international community. This international presence helped them also to have confidence in the future, for they knew they were not being forgotten. Now, when the return to the homeland approaches, they know that new problems, new difficulties will face them. For when they go back, they will be returning to areas that have been abandoned and deserted for many years. The wells will have crumbled, houses will have been destroyed, the land will have been untilled for years, there may be no livestock and no tools. To these families and their children, this will be a trying time. It will be necessary to maintain the international relief action, to keep them physically and morally in good health and prepared for the period when they will start rebuilding their lives. The international action will have to help this transition from the idleness of refugee existence to the active life as contributing members of a living community. This support may be vital. The troubadour sings the song of the future to the assembled children. Those who have given to you, he says, were happy because they gave. Give them your gratitude in return. In your world of the future, you must forget the days of bitter strife. For a world of peace is built on understanding among peoples. عالم حر جديد لبدا ينتصر وتزول غيار ما بين ما بين 